Thanks so much. I hope everyone is excited as I am for today's science battle. Um, for today, we have neuroscience versus robotics. So um, in the chat below, tell me what you're most excited for, uh, neuroscience or robotics. Um, and right now, I'm going to introduce who are going to be our fighters today. So in corner one, we have Olivia, the trainer Meisner. Olivia hails from New Orleans, Louisiana. She learned about neuroscience and Spanish at Emory University in Georgia. You would never guess from the science poster that we had up, but Olivia is a master trainer. She trained her cats to sit, spin in a circle, and stand up. I Wow, I can't train my cat to do anything. Um, when she isn't training her cats, she enjoys training herself to be the best at water polo, running, and painting. At the end of the day, to reward herself for all her hard work, Olivia, get, Olivia gets her favorite ice cream, which is mint Oreo. Once again, representing neuroscience, we have Olivia. And in the second corner, we have Vatsal, the precisionist Patel. Vatsal hails from the little country of Qatar. Say, tell me in the chat if you um, know where Qatar is. Um, Vatsal traveled across the world to go to the University of California, Berkeley for college. As the champion of spinning things on his fingers and peeling bananas, he tries to teach robots to beat him so he finally has a worthy opponent. Uh, despite his dangerous occupation and hobbies, he's nearly invincible and has never broken a bone in his entire life. Once again, representing robotics, we have Vatsal. And so now that I've introduced you to the speakers, once again, throw in the chat who you think is going to win, Olivia or Vatsal. Okay, and to determine who's going to go first, we are going to have a coin flip. Eli, the coin. All right, uh, because I am partial to neuroscience, I'm going to let Olivia uh, call it. So Olivia, I'm going to click here and you tell me heads or tails. I'll say tails. Hey, all right. Uh, you get to, I guess you get to go first or do you get to choose? Uh, I'll let you choose if you want to go first or last. I'll go first. Okay, so Olivia is going first. Before the battle begins, do you have any final words you want to say to your opponent? Well, before we get started, I just want everyone to remember that it's the brains that create robots, not the other way around. So I think we all know which one is superior here. Oh, okay, okay. Olivia's got the brains. That's out. Do you have anything to say to that? Well, I'm just really excited to listen to your talk. And uh, talk not so much, but the cat, I want to be the cat. OK, so points for the cat. And without further ado, Olivia, um, go ahead and get started. All right, thank you very much. OK, so today I will be presenting my research aimed at helping us understand how our brains help us to make social decisions. And again, my name is Olivia Meisner, and some of you actually may have met me when I talked about my pathway to science a few weeks ago. One of the things I mentioned at that point was that ever since I was a kid, I was always very interested in understanding why and how people make the decisions that they do. And as I got into research, I realized that I was more specifically interested in learning about what motivates people specifically in social situations and what goes on in their brains as they make social decisions. Because of this, I started to research social behaviors. One important social behavior is cooperation. So first we need to understand what exactly is cooperation. Cooperation is the process of two or more organisms working together to achieve the same goal. When you think of cooperation, the first thing you might think of is two humans working on something together, as you see here in this picture, with the dad helping his child build with toy blocks. But humans are not the only beings that cooperate. Here's an example of one monkey grooming another. In the next picture, you see two hawks hunting together. One is standing on the back of the other one to get a better view of potential prey. 
and even insects like bees cooperate. In this last picture, you see the bees forming a bridge between two parts of the swarm. I'm sure all of you have cooperated with someone at some point. What's the last time you cooperated on a task with someone and who was it with? Feel free to put your answers in the, in the chat. Now that we know what cooperation is, we can start asking questions such as what processes are involved in cooperation. When someone is deciding whether or not to cooperate with someone else, they'll probably have some thoughts that help them decide what they want to do. For example, if some people ask you to help them build something, you might ask yourself, what will I get out of cooperating? If these are people that you know, you might think about if they've helped you in the past. Maybe you would be more likely to cooperate if they had helped you before. Or you might also think about who is asking you to cooperate. Or you might even wonder if anything bad will happen to you if you don't cooperate. All of these thoughts are an important part of making a decision in a social situation. But what exactly is happening in our brains when we have these thoughts and decide whether or not we want to be cooperative with someone? That's what I'm trying to figure out with my research. As we start to think about studying the brain, it's helpful to understand the different parts and what they're important for. Here you can see the outlines of the four main parts of the brain. While there's a lot of communication going on between the different regions and even some overlap in what they do, each of these regions is particularly important for certain types of behaviors and abilities. One region I wanna highlight is the frontal lobe. This area does a lot of work related to decision-making, problem solving, and expressing emotions. Because a lot of the behaviors involved in cooperation are related to decision-making and problem solving, my research will focus on the frontal lobe. We also need to zoom in a little closer and think about what these four regions are made up of. And the answer to that, of course, is cells. Cells are often called the building blocks of life. This is because they're the smallest living thing that organisms are made up of. There are many different types of cells throughout the body, and each different type is built for a certain purpose. And because they are all made for a different purpose, they all have different features that make them good at their jobs. Today, we'll be talking about cells found in your brain. This is generally what they look like on the right here. And you can see that they're very long compared to other cells. Can anyone guess why they're so long? Let's see if we get any answers in the chat. Okay, we got someone saying to send signals, someone saying connecting to other cells. Wow, you guys are spot on. That's exactly right. So the purpose of these cells is to send messages from one part of the brain to the other. So how exactly do these brain cells communicate? Well, if you've ever played the game telephone, you actually might already have a idea. In the game telephone, the first person has a message that they then whisper into the ear of the next person. Then that person tells the message to the next person and so on until the message reaches the last kid in the red shirt. Brain cells actually communicate in a very similar way. The first neuron on the end gets a message and it sends it to the next neuron, which sends it to the next neuron, and so on until the message reaches its final destination. To understand this better, we can take a closer look at how this happens in the brain. In your brain, you have a lot of neurons, and these neurons are all in different parts of your brain, and so they each care about something unique, depending on where they're located. For example, if you see a dog, the first brain cells might get a message about seeing something. They then send this message to the back part of the brain, which is important for vision. A neuron there might say something like, I see a dog. Then this neuron will send that info to the front part of your brain, which is important for making decisions. Once the message gets there, the brain cells might say something like, hey, I really wanna pet that dog. So that's a general idea of how signals related to decision-making are sent throughout the brain. Now that we know about how brain cells communicate, we have to think about how exactly we can study these cells. One way that we can study brain cells is by looking at the brains of other animals. For my research, I study the brain activity of marmosets. Marmosets are a small monkey as seen here. Um, they're about the size of a squirrel. And one thing that's really great about marmosets is that they're very pro-social, which means that they like to do things to help other monkeys. 
on the left here, this monkey is carrying infant marmosets, and by doing so, he's helping out the mother. And the marmoset on the right is sharing food with another animal. Because they like to help each other out a lot, this means that there's a really good chance that they'll also cooperate in the lab. Because of this, I plan to study what happens in marmoset brains during cooperation. Even though marmoset brains are different from human brains, and the marmoset brain is this one on the left and the human brain is on the right, um, even though their brains are different, marmosets are still primates, which means they're pretty closely related to humans compared to lots of other animals. So we can use what we find out about marmoset brains to get a better understanding of what might also be happening in human brains during cooperation. Because brain cells are the ones sending messages about everything going on in our brains, understanding what brain cells talk about is really important to understand how our brains help us to make social decisions. As researchers, we have a lot of cool techniques that allow us to listen in on the conversations going on between brain cells. One thing we can do is kind of spy on the brain cells and listen to what they're saying. I'll explain how this works. First, think about the brain inside the marmoset's head. Then, inside his brain, he has a neuron. Well, he has lots of neurons, actually. And as researchers, we can insert a recording device inside his brain. This doesn't hurt the animal since you actually don't have any pain receptors inside your brain. This means if someone were to poke your brain, you actually wouldn't feel anything. So once we've put the recording device inside his brain, we can now hear all of the conversations that the cells are having. The recording device lives inside a cap that stays on the marmoset's head. You can think of this as a little hat that the marmoset wears. So from now on, anytime you see a marmoset wearing a hat, just know that this means that we can listen in on the conversations that these cells are having. Once we have the marmoset set up so that we can listen to their brain cells, we need a way to get them to cooperate in the lab. One way to do this is with this task shown here. Let's see if this video will work. Okay, here we go. Um, so in this task, you will see that there are it loads, you'll see that there are two animals. In this video, it happens to be wolves. Give it a second. So, okay, here we go. Um, so you'll see two wolves and an apparatus in the front. And on this apparatus, there is a rope that the wolves can pull on to move the apparatus forward. Um, and if they pull this rope at the same time, it moves this tray forward and they're able to get a, a treat. You can see that they both get the treat because they both um, pulled the tray forward. Um, and this is a way to get animals to cooperate in the lab. And this has actually been used in many different types of animals, including elephants seen in the top right, and even crows seen in the, in the bottom right. So to better understand what's happening in marmoset brains when they cooperate, I will have marmosets do the same type of task. Here you can see that there are two marmosets and each one has access to either end of the rope. And if they both pull on the rope at the same time, the platform will move forward and they will get their favorite treat, which is a marshmallow. You can also see that they're wearing their special hats. This means that we can listen to what their brain cells are saying while they're deciding whether or not to cooperate. By recording the brain cells as the marmosets do this task, I will be able to learn about what parts of the brain are most important for these types of social decisions. I'm also interested in understanding what aspects of these social decisions the brain cares about the most. To study what the brain cells care about, I can change different parts of the experiment to see what situations make the brain cells talk the most. So for example, maybe sometimes the marmoset is doing the task with another marmoset from his family. Other times, maybe he's doing the task with a stranger monkey. Would you pull the rope to help your friend get a marshmallow? What if the other person was a stranger? Feel free to let me know in the chat if you would help out a friend or a stranger if you think that would affect your behavior. Got a lot of yeses. Yes, you guys would be cooperative. Um, 
And in a similar way, we can also look at how reward amount affects behavior and how brain cell conversations change because of that. So think about how would your behavior change if your partner got a marshmallow, but you didn't? Would you still help them? What if they got a lot and you got none? Or what if they got a lot and you only got a little? So would these factors change how you would behave? We've got a very cooperative group here. It looks like most people are saying they would still help out. Not a few no's thrown in there though. So as you guys have answered in the chat, it looks like these different factors would affect how you would behave. And we expect the same to be true for marmosets as well. So by changing different parts of the experiment, we can learn about how the conversations between brain cells are different based off of these factors in social decisions. Once we've recorded what the cells are doing while marmosets cooperate, we can look at what these cells care about. Remember from the dog example that cells in different parts of the brain talk about different things to help us make decisions. To understand what cells talk about while marmosets decide if they want to cooperate, we will look at how different factors affect how loud the cells are. For example, we might want to see if there are cells that care about the relationship between two monkeys. To see if this is the case, we can compare how loud a cell is when a marmoset is cooperating with another marmoset from his family versus when he's cooperating with a stranger monkey that he's never met before. If, as shown here, the cell is really loud with the related monkey, but actually kind of quiet with the stranger monkey, then this tells us that this brain cell in particular might be involved in getting us to cooperate with familiar partners, but not unfamiliar partners. In a similar way, we expect to find many different brain cells that care about different factors that can be used to help us make social decisions. Using the same comparison method, we can try to understand how the conversations between brain cells help us to make decisions in social situations. In addition to looking for cells that care about the relationship between two monkeys, we can also look for cells that care about how much reward they got or cells that care about if their partner has cooperated with them in the past or not. To summarize, my research is using techniques that, that allow me to listen to the conversations between brain cells in marmosets as they decide whether or not to cooperate in different social situations. By doing this, I'm hoping to get a better understanding of how the conversations between cells in our brain help us to make social decisions about whether or not to cooperate. I also, of course, want to thank the labs that I work with. Um, so I, my project is a collaboration between three different labs. Um, I'd also like to thank my program for supporting this, the people who pay for the experiments, and of course, the marmosets. So I hope you learned something new from my talk today, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Olivia, for a great presentation. Um, when you were talking about the different um, cooperation experiments, you know, I myself didn't know if I wanted to cooperate if, you know, the other monkey was getting three marshmallows and I got none. So I'm looking forward to hearing about your results sometime in the future. Um, we are now going to be hearing um, from Vatsal, who is going to be telling us about um, his research. So take it away, Vatsal. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, I am a PhD student in the mechanical engineering department uh, here at Yale. And before that, I was uh, working at a company building robots for surgery, but um, also doing some research on how these robots do with the surgery and what we can do to help the surgeons and surgical staff uh, who are operating these uh, machines. So I want to share with you some of those technologies, some of those um, areas where robots are doing some really cool things, where we are today and where we go from here. Uh, one quick little warning, there are some visuals in my presentation which might make some people uncomfortable. I apologize if that, um, that does to you uh, and please feel free to uh, step away from the, from the meeting um, if that does to you. And um, yeah, I apologize in advance if that happens to you. Uh, but uh, I think it's gonna be really exciting. So let's go in uh, and get started. So uh, when we think of surgery, this is usually what we think of, right? We think of big incisions. Incision is a cut in your skin or, or tissue that a surgeon would make uh, or, or surgical staff would make in order to access the organs and tissues inside your body. 
and work on them, right? So they want full view of everything, uh, and they want to be able to want to be able to access it and work with work on it with their hands. So this is what we usually think of surgery. There's multiple people around. The skin is being pulled, uh, or it needs to be stretched open. Uh, otherwise, it just wants to close up again. Uh, and the patient patient is obviously under anesthesia, so they don't feel anything. Uh, but a couple of decades back, uh, or, or uh, about a decade back. Uh, surgeons started coming up with this new kind of surgery, uh, surgical procedure to do the same things that they were doing before called minimally invasive surgery. So as the name suggests, uh, minimal invasion uh, inside the body. So instead of making just one large incision on the, on the, on the torso or wherever uh, you're operating or wherever the operation needs to be done, uh, surgeons and surgical staff would put in just four or five tiny holes, maybe the size of your of your finger, so eight eight or ten uh, millimeter in diameter, and then we put put these ports uh, in these holes, and then put instruments, uh, surgical instruments through these holes, and a and a video camera in one of those holes so that they can see what's going on inside. And this is really cool because um, now. Uh, for lots of different kinds of surgery, for instance, if you wanted to have some some kind of repair procedure on your spine, instead of cutting open a big large cut on your back, you could just make four or six tiny little incisions on your back. Um, if you wanted to have, or if you needed to have some kind of gallbladder bladder surgery, for instance, you could again just have uh, four or five tiny incisions around your liver and around your gallbladder and do the same procedure. So again, the same exact procedure, but now with uh, much smaller incisions. So some of you might already have an idea of why um, smaller incisions are better, but um, let's go through why, um, the, clearly why these, uh, why these smaller incisions might be better uh, for the patient and for the surgical procedure. So this is an example of what, this, what the video camera would look like through one of those, one of those tiny little cuts in the body. Uh, you would put it through one of those holes and it'll be able to see what's going on inside and the surgical staff and the surgeon will be able to see what's going on in the body. Um, the tools are usually handheld. So on one end of this, uh, on the top end of this uh, camera, for instance, there would be one um, surgeon or one surgical staff person holding that camera and then moving it around uh, to, to, to a position where uh, they might want to see something else uh, or, or now operate on a different part of the body. Uh, so there are tons of different kinds of tools that they might use, depends on the procedure. They might have a scissor and a grasper and a long grasper and some that might uh, have some kind of energy to cauterize the tissue. Cautery just means to burn the tissue so that you can seal it together. Uh, so lots of different kinds of instruments are out there um, and surgeons will use a host of those uh, during a procedure. They might even put in and remove one uh, if they need to do a different kinds of uh, tasks on, uh, on uh, different kinds of tasks on the, in the procedure. So smaller incisions are better. You have less blood loss, less pain, less in infections, uh, less scarring. The patient can recover really quickly. So uh, after the procedure, they might be going home in days. If, uh, and, and previously, might, they might have to, had to stay for a whole week uh, to just recover from the procedure itself. And you have fewer complications and it, overall just uh, a much cleaner procedure. So this is what one of those camera looks like. It's usually just a long cylindrical rod with uh, a, a camera in the front of, uh, of that big, uh, big long rod that goes through one of these uh, tiny holes in the body. So this is what minimally invasive surgery usually uh, looks like. But with, the procedure, with this kind of a procedure, there's also some issues. Uh, one of the big issues is what is usually called in the field as fulcrum effect. So let's take one of these instruments, right? You put it through the, one of those incisions in the body, you can't just move the instrument wherever you want. You have to basically remove, uh, move it about the point of the skin. Um, so if you push the instrument on the top to the right, the instrument at the end, at the tip end is going to move to the left. Um, if you push it to the left, it's going to go to the right. So this is kind of like a straw going through um, like a takeout uh, like soda container that you might get. If you move the straw to the to the right on the top uh, where your where your where your mouth is, then the straw on the bottom where the ice cubes and the beverage mm -hmm. liquid is goes to the left, right? So this actually gets really complicated because now you have to basically do the opposite motion of what you want to do throughout the whole procedure, and that's really complicated and much harder to learn, and uh, train and get experience on in order to do something to do a whole surgical procedure. The other big issue is that because you can't really actually see inside the body directly, you have to look up and the surgeon and the surgical staff have to look up at a video screen while they're operating on the patient uh, on the patient table. So here you can see these surgeons are actually looking up at a video screen where the images from the, one of those video cameras is being shown. So they're looking up at a, at a TV, at a video screen, and then operating on the patient body. So it's, a, it's again, it's a very tough skill to learn, uh, if you, especially if you wanted to do some complicated procedures with de very delicate tasks. Uh, surgeons usually go under a lot of training and experience and, and require uh, get a lot of experience working alongside someone maybe for long periods of time in order to 
to get uh, ex expertise at this uh, uh, at minimally invasive surgery. So that's what MIS stands for, minimally invasive surgery. And this is exactly where robotics comes in. So robotics says, all right, uh, uh, we're going to solve some of these major issues that you have with minimally invasive surgery while keeping the advantages that you already have of smaller incisions, faster recovery times, less blood, lo less blood loss, less pain, all of those. So it's all robot, ass robot assisted. So none of, the ta none of the movements are done by the robot on its own. Everything is controlled by the surgeon. And I'll show you how that's actually done. So this is what uh, a robot assisted minimally invasive surgery looks like. Instead of the surgeon and surgical staff holding the instruments, the robot is now holding the instruments. And the surgeon is sitting at a console with joysticks and looking through kind of like a, almost like a virtual reality headset, um, looking at the view from one of those cameras that's th going through in one of those ports. So now the surgeon is sitting at a console using joysticks and moving the instruments that are actually at the patient side. And now because you have a robot in this uh, loop, the robot can take care of uh, converting all that fulcrum effect and the mirroring uh, of all those instrument movements. The surgeon just has to move exactly where they want to go, and the robot will do the math to to move uh, to move in the opposite direction and then move the instruments in that exact way. So it's it's it's, it's, a, it's almost like a video game now, where you're operating uh, the tooltips exactly the way you want to move them, and they also don't have to look up on some video screen. You have the 3D image right in the console, just like basically if, you, if any of you have tried like a virtual reality headset, it's basically like that. Uh, the surgeon just looks through uh, those kind of goggles uh, in the console itself. So it's, it's a lot easier for the surgeon now. They can do much more complicated procedures. They can do it for longer periods of time. They don't get tired as, as easily. Um, so overall, it just helps um, improve the outcomes of, for the patient uh, much, much more while doing more complicated procedures for the patient. So the same procedures, but now assisted by the robot. So this is what one of those robots looks like. Uh, this is one of the robots that I actually worked on uh, building. So in this case, they have four of those robot arms holding instruments while the surgeon sits at this particular console and looks through these kind of goggles. And they use these joysticks uh, to manipulate or move the instruments uh, that are connected to these four arms that are at the patient side. So here you can see a surgeon is using those joysticks to move the instruments around. And every, every motion that the surgeon does, the robot does the exact motion. The, the robot on its own has no intelligence. Uh, um, it, it basically just replicates whatever the surgeon is doing. Because here, the expert is the surgeon. It's not the robot. The robot is just a tool that the surgeon is using. So you can do really complicated things with it. You can kind of sew. You can cut. You can do all kinds of interesting things with the, with the robot here. Uh, so this is one of the uh, sort of demonstrations of those tasks. Uh, here, the surgeon is actually sitting on, at a console and trying to sew the skin of a grape back together on onto the grape again. Uh, and I remember I talked about uh, minimal invasion, right? So you only have to make tiny little cuts in the body uh, to, to, to put these instruments through. And as this picture zooms out, you'll see that all of this is actually being done. Um, uh, all the sewing of the skin back onto the grape is actually being done uh, inside uh, a bottle, actually. So it's in a very tight, constrained space. But you can do really complicated tasks, really delicate tasks. So I'll wait for this picture to zoom out so you can actually see that it's actually just done um, inside uh, just an opening of a, of a bottle. So uh, just that kind, that that um, size opening in your body, and you can have a grape inside of you, mm -hmm. or, or a similar procedure being done inside of you. So again, really complicated procedure, but um, done through a very small opening. So naturally, since there are robots, there's always going to be the question: All right, when do we automate this, or should we even automate surgery? Um, obviously, surgery is a very complicated process. Surgeons go through years of training in medical school and then years of training on the field in, in hospital rooms, uh, right? So it's not an easy task to automate. Uh, but there are portions of surgery that might be helped by some automation. So in surgery, there's actually a lot of repeated tasks. Uh, think about suturing a wound, right? The suturing is sewing things up. So if you've ever gotten stitches, there's a lot of repeated motion that the surgeon has to do. Uh, procedures, surgical procedures can go on for hours at a time. It can be really tiring, really fatiguing for the staff, for the surgeons. If you can automate pieces of that, um, of that procedure, some tiny little task that the surgeon just has to press a button and it, it, it executes that task, maybe you can reduce some of that tiring, some of that fatiguing for the surgeon. And then they can free up their time, free up their brain power to focus on the more complex stuff, the more delicate and the more interesting uh, or the, the more uh, uh, complex tasks uh, in the procedure. Uh, but obviously, the question is, would you be willing to go into uh, a surgery that's being partially automated by a robot, right? You would have to know that it's absolutely safe, that the, the robot is not going to make any mistake at all. And only then would a patient actually agree to do this, right? So even when these robots were first being introduced in the in operating rooms, patients had their doubts. 
But um, since then, there's about, I think, 5,000 or over 5,000 robots now worldwide that are doing, uh, that are helping surgeons do the surgery today. Uh, obviously, none of it is automated. The surgeon is doing, just using the robot as a tool to do the surgery. Um, but uh, naturally, we have to see if these uh, algorithms that we put on the robot uh, are, are safe. So let's just quickly look at what, um, what things are automated by robots today. Uh, first of all, you have things which are really complex complex tasks. Uh, in this case, a robot is uh, navigating a, a site of a uh, natural disaster, but there's some kind of control person sitting in the back and moving the robot like, an, like a remote controlled car and moving it around. So none of that is automated, right? Um, and then you have robots in factories. So this is at the, at the top is a, a car factory. So imagine like a Tesla factory. And the bottom is actually a warehouse, possibly an Amazon warehouse, right? So you order, you order something, a tiny little robot goes in, picks up the shelf that the item is on, and brings it to a person then who puts it into a box and then ships it to you, right? So these are simpler tasks, uh, more structured, um, that the robots can easily be used for automation in. But the really tough problem is automating the more complex tasks. So right now, where surgeons are uh, doing surgery, or in this case, a natural disaster, or someone is moving the robot around in some kind of rubble and rocks and everything is around too. That's a really hard part. Um, and that's where uh, most of robotics is actually working towards today. So computer science, AI, all of that is being used to allow robots to do um, automate their tasks in complex environments. So one of those examples is self-driving cars. Um, we as humans are extremely unpredictable, right? Um, uh, you have pedestrians, you have other drivers, you don't know what, what they would do. So that's, again, a very complex task for the robot to automate. Um, so let me give you. A, let me just show you one video of what an actual surgery with or, uh, with one of these Da Vinci robots looks like, and you you'll appreciate how hard it might be to automate uh, some of that uh, some of that um, some of those motions. So you can see there's a lot of body motion here, right? Uh, the part is uh, beating. The, the your your torso is because of breathing. Your torso is moving. There's other motions uh, that are connected to your kidney and intestines. There's lots of motion that's going on um, around the body. So it's really hard to automate. So that's the problem that I was interested in, uh, in trying to address. So we went and asked uh, an expert surgeon, all right, if you were to do a surgery on something that's moving, how would you actually go about doing this? So we put the surgeon, uh, Dr. Boyd, in front of this moving platform uh, and said, all right, surgeon, go ahead and do these two tasks for us. One is cutting and one is debridement. Debridement just means uh, picking out something. So if you had, say, for instance, we saw these monkeys picking out um, uh, flee from someone from another monkey. That's just a breedment. That's just a fancy word for that. Uh, so this is the kind of platform we use to mimic that kind of motion for them, for the surgeon. And then we saw what the surgeon actually did. And we used that data. We saw what the surgeon was actually doing. And then we implemented it on a robot. So this is a robot completely automated, completely uh, uh, autonomous robot doing uh, surgical cutting on a line while the platform is moving. So it's sped up five times, but uh, you can see it actually cuts on the line pretty consistently. And the trick here is to wait for uh, portions of time when this platform, or in this case, the human body stops moving. So if you're breathing or if your heart is beating, there are portions of time in between when your body uh, just is at pause for some time. And that's the point where we, uh, our algorithm decided would be the best time to go and cut or make a cut um, in some kind of tissue. Um, so again, this is completely autonomous. There's no surgeon sitting at a console and actually doing this. Um, but again, this is not in a human body. It's just an experiment uh, outside um, on, uh, on, on, on surgical material or surgical-like material uh, to simulate that kind of an environment. The other task I mentioned was debridement. Uh, in this case, we were just using these tiny black seeds uh, to go and pick them up. And this is actually, again, really hard because these seeds are so small. And this tool is actually really small, too. And while this platform is just going crazy, moving around like your human, like a human body would actually during surgery, um, the robot is able to go and completely autonomously pick out those seeds. So uh, it, it's actually quite uh, imp uh, impressive that the robot can do this completely autonomous and shows us that it's possible for us to do this kind of task um, uh, completely autonomously. Um, obviously, this doesn't just end at surgical robotics. Uh, the work that I did today is more on robot manipulation, which just means uh, how do we get the robot to get out into uh, areas where there are humans, so in our homes, in our, uh, in our, in our bedrooms, in our kitchens, uh, while, they might, while some people might need help with, um, in healthcare or in, uh, in, in just elderly care, for instance, uh, we make uh, simple, safe robots that um, can do the same kind of autonomous task, but without hurting the humans. So, Olivia mentioned we're trying to learn how humans cooperate with each other. Eventually, we might want to have robots also 
um, out in the field working with humans and we want to know if humans cooperate with each other so that we can then uh, replicate that behavior on um, robots and get us to do the same kind of things that they do but alongside us beside us right so these are just some um, images from things that we do in our task we use a lot of everyday objects like your cheese boxes and jello boxes to uh, simulate uh, everyday motions and every kind of object um, None of this happens alone, obviously. This is just an action shot from one of our lab meetings. And uh, obviously, all of this work is being done in teams, in groups, everywhere, uh, everywhere around. So um, I hope that helps you understand a little bit uh, about the world of surgical robotics and about the world of robotics. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session. Uh, and thanks a lot for your attention. And thank you so much, Vatsal, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I had seen the things about doing surgery on a grape, um, but it's really cool to um, get to hear your presentation um, explaining how it all um, comes together. All right, so we're going to be closing up the polls now, and um, April will be back to um, uh, ask some questions of our two speakers that we heard from today. Thanks, Deandra. Um, we've got a lot of questions for you guys. Um, so I'm first going to start with uh, Olivia. And uh, something that everyone wanted to see was your cat. Um, so if you could gather up that kitty and show the people and give the people what they want, that would be great. Okay. Here is Cleo. I just woke her up from her nap to bring her here so she might look a little angry. <laughs> it's a very cute kitty. Everyone in the chat is uh, commenting on how cute she is. <laughs> very adorable. Okay, um, so actual science questions. Um, the kids were really interested in knowing more about messages sent from neuron to neuron. So one question is, uh, what is the destination of these messages um, and how are thoughts made? Yeah, those are both two really good questions. Um, I think, so to answer your first question, the destination of these signals really depends on what exactly that signal is and what its purpose is. So kind of like how I talked about how there are different parts of the brain that have different functions, um, the destination of a signal will differ based off of what the purpose of it is. So if you're getting a signal um, from the eyes that's going and it's supposed to be helping you determine what it is that you're seeing, then the destination of that signal would be in the back of the brain, which is important for vision. Um, but if there's a signal that is helping you just helping you to decide um, what you want to do with the thing that you just saw, the destination of that signal might be the, in the front of the brain, which is important for decision making. Um, and then to answer the second part of the question, which is how do thoughts originate? Um, that one's a little bit tougher to tackle um, and something I've thought about a lot. Um, and it's maybe more philosophical, but I think that might come down to some combination of spontaneous signals from neurons, as well as how your neurons react, or neurons are the brain cells, um, how your brain cells react to the different things that you see in the environment or hear or taste, touch or smell. So I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into that. Awesome, thanks so much, Olivia. Okay, my next question is gonna be for you, Vetzal. Um, so some students were wondering, um, are robots currently being used in surgery? Is this a theory? Is this an idea? Um, or is it a reality? It is absolutely a reality. Um, so the distinction that I would make is there's robot assisted surgery, which is um, surgeon is controlling every aspect of what the robot is trying to do. And the robot is just a kind of like a tool. It's just a passive tool that the surgeon is moving around. And that is being used everywhere. There's, I said, like 5,000 plus robots around the world, um, just like the ones I showed uh, that are just doing that part of surgery. But there's tons of, one, uh, tons of others uh, doing eye surgery and orthopedics, so like bo uh, working on bones. Uh, the part of surgery that we don't have robots doing is any kind of automation. So anything that the robot has to do on its own, we don't allow currently robots to do that because we don't think it's safe um, yet. And it's mostly just in research that that's happening. 
Awesome. Um, and a follow up to that question would be, um, how are robots able to have such precise movements compared to humans? That's the big advantage of uh, having a robot, right? Um, you can make a giant motor set on the top of this robot that can pick up uh, loads that a human can't. Or, or on the other way, you can have really tiny motors that will do really delicate tasks that your finger can't do. So that's the advantage of using uh, machines for to do very specific things and building machines that can do really specific tasks, in this case, uh, surgery, that would allow you to do really delicate movements um, and cut really precisely or do things really at a really small scale. So that's just inherent to the advantage of using machines for really specific tasks uh, as opposed to humans. Awesome. Thanks, that's all. OK, Olivia, next question for you. Um, and this one's about the hat, the recording device. So someone was wondering, how do you insert the recording device and how do you track thoughts? Um, if you could just explain a little bit more about the nature of the recording device. Sure. Um, so yeah, this technology is, is really amazing. Um, and the way that it works in terms of implanting the recording device. So this is actually a surgery um, where you would anesthetize the animal um, in order to implant the device inside their brain. Um, and so even though your brain doesn't have pain receptors, you still need to anesthetize them um, because you need to get the recording device past the skull and inside the brain. Um, and this, if anyone's interested, this is actually also done in humans um, as a, treat, a way to treat certain um, neurological disorders such as Parkinson's. So if you're interested in seeing how this type of technology can help people, um, you can look up YouTube videos about that. And it's very interesting. I would definitely recommend. Um, so once we have the device implanted, we can use the device to um, kind of to record the electrical signals that are being sent from one neuron to another. Um, and so when we read the electrical signals, this gives us an idea of how active certain cells are in different brain regions. And then from there, we can better understand what brain regions are active during certain parts of the task. So if the cells in a certain part of the brain um, have a lot of electrical signals as they are evaluating the reward or evaluating their social partner, then this can help us to understand that the brain cells in that region are probably involved in that part of the decision. Awesome, thank you. Um, that's all, this question is for you. Uh, someone was wondering, how are the robots programmed to do exactly what the joystick does? Um, how do they know what to do? Yeah, that's a very good question. There's tons of people in, in the group that makes these robots just working on uh, something as simple as we want to replicate exactly what the surgeon is doing onto the robot, because that's very important, right? You don't want any kind of surprises for the surgeon itself um, and the robot moving in any direction that you don't want it to and moving exactly what the surgeon wants it to do. So it's actually a lot of math, a lot of um, math, like just algorithms, like pure math just, just goes into calculating uh, this much motion on the joystick corresponds to this much motion on the surgeon's on the tooltip and where the surgical robot is there. Um, so it's just a lot of math and then implemented using just like uh, programming computer science into the robots like firmware. So it's it's all built into the robot. It doesn't have to like look up on the internet how to do this. Uh, it's all just built into the robot without any uh, connection required outside. Wonderful. Um, and would using robots require the surgeons to undergo more training? That's a very good question. Yes, uh, they do go through about a month long of training, but a lot of surgeons pick it up pretty easily because one, it's a, a little bit easier to use, but also because they've used um, non-robotic tools before that transfer quite easily. Um, and there's a whole process to um, just the learning um, curriculum that teaches them how to take what they've learned already and then implement it uh, on, on the robot. So um, yes, it takes time, about a month, but uh, that's just because they've done all of this on something that's not a robot before. And they're just kind of importing all that knowledge and all that experience from there and then using it on a robot. So um, yeah. OK. And the last question will be for both of you. And I just want you to answer it in about 30 seconds. Um, how did you get into your area of science? 
Elevia, you can go first. Yeah, so as I mentioned in my talk, um, this is something that I've all, always had a natural curiosity for, just understanding what motivates people um, and why people make the decisions that they do. And then more specifically, um, I realized that I was really interested in understanding um, kind of like one of the questions, you know, how do thoughts arise um, and where does that come from? And so when I put those two things together, that led me to um, deciding to study the brain and how they relate to different types of social decisions. And that's all? Uh, mostly by accident. Um, I was, saw a robot through a, like a door that was partially ajar in one of my professor's office um, and went and asked him and he was nice enough to just open this whole world for me about robotics um, and then transitioned me into uh, surgical robotics and I just thought that was extremely extremely rewarding to work um, in kind of this medical field that's um, that's helping patients that's um, helping surgeons and uh, improving outcomes for uh, people so um, yes uh, mostly mostly by accident awesome thanks so much guys you both had fantastic presentations uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Josie okay I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat who are really anxious to know who won. So that's what I'm here for. Um, okay, so those were both absolutely fantastic talks. I really, really enjoyed hearing both of them. Um, but now the students have spoken. So we would like to have a drum roll from everyone. Dramatic drum roll, I see it in the chat, fantastic. I love everyone's enthusiasm. All right, so the first question that we asked everyone who listened to both talks was how understandable was the presentation? And on one to five, Olivia got a 4.4, that's very good. And that Saul got, say, a 4.3, so that's really close, that's amazing. Okay, but Olivia, a little bit ahead. Question two, how much did this presentation spark your curiosity and imagination? Okay, Olivia, coming in at like a little under 4.2, not bad. But Saul coming in, I guess that's slightly lower, but again, like let's pretty much almost call this one a tie. So that I think they both thought you guys were really creative. They definitely, a lot of curiosity and imagination. Question three, uh, how much more do you feel like you know about this topic compared to before? So how much did you learn? Uh, say 4.3 for Olivia. But saw a little bit higher. So you guys learned a little bit more <laughs> from that second talk. So really close on all of these. But if we average these all together to get our winner, we have... Olivia as our winner for this time, but so close, both clearly well-loved talks. So huge congratulations to both of you, a little bit extra to Olivia. Um, <laughs> and thank you both um, for all the time and effort you put into putting those together for us. Um, really enjoyed 